Hiroshima will only be right, long be right. Time and memory, scars that remain. Flash of an instant, poor world can change, whole world can change. Fear and arrogance, fiery seeds of hate. to see you in your face, help to seal your face, Hiroshima long may you ride, from your black and ashes white doves take flight. Hiroshima, long may you ride, long may you ride, long may you ride. Intellect and precision, logic that you preach, on its silhouettes. Redemption and forgiveness Lie left for sin Clean floating candle Thousand vapor cream Thousand vapor cream Hiroshima long may Black and ashes, white doves to fly From the poison sea to curl white pine Hiroshima long may Aloha and welcome to the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center, an afternoon with the author. Uh, today is a very special afternoon with the author as we remember Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That piece that you just heard uh, was composed and performed by Lucas Maihara Rotman. Lucas is a teacher and a musician located on the East Coast. He is also the grandson of Maui Nisei veteran Saburo Maihara, which I know is a familiar name for many of us on this Zoom call. We wanna thank Lucas for reaching out to us when he knew we were doing this talk, um, allowing us to use his piece, Hiroshima, Long May You Rise. We thank you, Lucas. And if you're interested in more of Lucas's music, you can find him on the web at Lucas and the Melodic Miners. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, my name is Deidre Teagarden. I am the executive director here at the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center, where our mission is to inspire people to find the hero within themselves through the legacy of the Nisei veterans. 
And uh, we are so honored to have with us today, Melinda Clark. She is the author of Waymakers for Peace. And uh, again, the stories of the A-bomb survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on this very important day. But before I introduce our speaker, I just wanted to go over a few quick housekeeping items. Number one, a huge mahalo to our generous, generous sponsors who make these programs available to all of our viewing audience for free. Please help me welcome Housemart, or please help me thank Housemart, Arizumi Brothers, Abbey Carpet of Maui, Maui Health Systems, Maui Sons and Daughters of the Nisei Veterans, Munekio Haraga, Purell Specialty Water, and Say Design. Thank you so much. We also welcome questions during the talk. You'll see the little question and answer box at the bottom left of your screen. Feel free to send in your questions. Our guest has offered to answer whichever ones we don't get to today. She can answer them offline at a later date. So you can send those to me and I will get them to her and she will respond to you. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our Nisei Veterans Memorial Center YouTube channel in about uh, a week and a half. So we hope that you can uh, check us out there as well. And we wanted to let everybody know that you will be getting a follow-up email from us as well as our weekly Wednesday update, which is a e-newsletter we send out once a week, letting you know what kind of events we have coming up. Uh, you can unsubscribe from those emails at any time, but we do hope that you uh, stay subscribed because you are part of our Nisei Veterans Memorial Center family and uh, we love communicating with you. It gives me great pleasure at this time to introduce our speaker today. A Pennsylvania native, a journalist and teacher by trade, Melinda Clark is an accidental activist who began marching to her own tune after the Three Mile Island incident in 1979. Having lived in Japan in 1964, she had a calling to move back in the 1980s with her two children, where they embarked on a multi-year journey in Japan, China, and for a little while in Europe. Um, while in Japan, she began recording the Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors' stories. Her worldview shifted, and it wasn't long before she became a passionate advocate for peace. Ms. Clark has written on peace issues for the Christian Science Monitor and the Japan Times, and has spoken on peace issues across Japan and the U.S. mainland, including the University of Pennsylvania and the World Bank. Ms. Clark inspires others to live a life of peace and purpose, and recently walked and completed the 900-mile Shikoku pilgrimage. On a personal note, among other things, uh, Melinda Clark is my mother, and my brother Gavin and I are eternally grateful for this wonderful journey she has taken us on and uh, continues to take us on. And we don't have enough time to get into all her stories, including um, our, one of our, my brother and my, my favorites, uh, her time in a Cambodian prison in the 1960s, but we'll save that for another time. Um, so without further ado, please help me welcome uh, Melinda Clark. Aloha, Melinda. Aloha, I think I, my time's up, isn't it? No. Nope. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> okay, well, uh, thank you, Deidre. Thank you to the Nisei veterans for allowing this. Uh, and for uh, promoting this. And also thank you for everybody who has joined. Uh, there's so many things out there with the uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, especially this year. I mean, some of the events have been going on for like four or five days. However, I think this may be a little bit different um, than the other ones because uh, I have an agenda. <laughs> and the agenda is to help people understand that what happened in Hiroshima, it wasn't just about bombing, buildings falling down, cities disappearing, men, people being vaporized like uh, water on a hot skillet. It is about people uh, who were victims. And my agenda is to get people to listen and take them off victim status give them their, their life and their survival and that terrible death, give it some meaning 
uh, so that they can become more than something on page 45 of an American uh, high school history book. These were people and uh, they need a voice. And so I'm trying to, my agenda is to raise them uh, from victims to waymakers. Uh, and I want to say something about the Nisei veterans at this time. They did an excellent job with this. When, in, when they had to go to war, the, their families were rounded up, put into camps. They left here second and third class citizens. They were set up to, to fail, you know, to be victims. But they came back and they came back as heroes. It was an amazing thing that they did. And they were awarded, they had, were some of the most meddled uh, people. And they taught us something. They taught us that no matter how bad it is, you suck it up, you have gone men, you go for broke, and you do what you can do, and you move forward. And when you move forward, you make it better for everybody, uh, for the life, for your community. Now, on the other hand, the Hibakusha, and that's the A-bomb survivor, the A-bomb survivor had an entirely different story. Uh, when they were victims and the bomb dropped, and either, whether they survived or whether they died, they were seen as the embodiment of shame. And shame in Japan was a very uh, big thing. I mean, people, generals committed harakiri because they lost in the war. And one of the reasons people were taken out and not given a chance to uh, commit harakiri, uh, which is uh, suicide, to kill themselves, is because uh, it was just seen as a disgrace and shame is just so big. Well, shame, the, the hibakshas were shamed. They were threatened. They were told to hide. They were told not to tell their story. Uh, this was all by the Japanese government. The Americans came, the American uh, forces, the occupation forces came in, took the cameras, their pictures, their film, every, anything, so that people in other countries couldn't see what the bomb did. I like to think that if we had seen the pictures from the very beginning, we as a country would have stood up and said, this is horrific and we're not supporting this, uh, the A-bomb. But we, we didn't, we didn't see anything until 35 years later. Uh, so that's, so my agenda to getting back to my, my agenda is to give them a voice so they can be our way makers. So you, the, the title of the book, of course, is Waymakers for Peace. It's their interviews. But um, for those of us who may not know, what, what is a waymaker? Okay. Thank you for asking. A waymaker is a person who helps you on your journey, who helps you accomplish your mission in life, even if just a small part. Someone who helps you get to your next destination. And their mission was to end war. So if we can... Uh, interpret their horrific deaths and painful survivor as more than victims. If we can see that war doesn't work, they let us, we allow them to be our way makers, then they can show us that no matter how big the bomb is, war doesn't work, then we give their death and their horrible long sacrifice of life meaning. And with that, if we can do that, with that, we put another hole in the war balloon. So, that's the agenda. And so I will let you go ahead and ask the next question. Okay. Well, I, um, I wanted to have you talk about really how we got started on this journey, but I also want to acknowledge um, Gavin Kelly, who is my brother, and he was just able to zoom in from uh, Connecticut. I think he's at a Dunkin' Donuts because they're um, uh, experiencing so many power outages um, there. But uh, Gavin, if you can maybe jump on here, um, you know, I, I want to talk to you a little bit later about the journey that, that you went on because of mother's interviews. Um, but, uh, you know, you were four years old at the time that mother took us to Japan, correct? Yes, I think, I, I think somewhere between four and five, inching towards five. And you were really uh, with her a lot of the time while she was doing these interviews, which we will get to. But I, I know that you're, where you're at closes in a, in a few minutes. So we just wanted to kind of um, switch things around and have you talk a little bit first about 
what impact these interviews that mother did, um, what kind of impact they had on you? Well, I remember once we moved to Hiroshima, I think by then I was around six, five to six. So between five and eight or six and eight, I got to join mother on some great interviews with Hibaksha. And, uh, you know, my, my initial like understanding of the Hibaksha were maybe through some comic books like uh, the Barefoot Gen series. But so I, I had seen sort of the horrifying imagery and how it affected families. But then once I started going on the interviews, uh, uh, I started having different, uh, more deeply rooted uh, connections with, with the Hibaksha. And I, I, I still remember to this day uh, uh, some of the meetings I remember one was with, I think, believe a banker inside of inside uh, an office building, or he was a he was a president of a company of some sort. I'm not exactly sure, uh, but I, as a child, that's what I remembered. And he would tell us the story about. Uh, he told us what he went through, and then I remember my mother asking. She usually asked this question. It would come around. What would you do today differently? What would you do today if it happened today? And he said he would uh, get on his knees with his family and he would just pray. Uh, rather than uh, uh, necessarily trying to uh, survive like he did before. So I just, that one always resonated with me. And uh, between those interviews and then going to Peace Park uh, in the mornings uh, uh, that I had off from school, I would, uh, uh, I started to have dreams and I, they sort of became recurring nightmares. I started thinking, well, what if I was there? Or my, my dreams are essentially running from the bomb with, with, the, with the both of you. Um, and always, you know, waking up just as the bomb was exploding and trying to force myself back to sleep and always seeing us recover and get inside a door. And that one door that we got behind would save us. Um, so I started talking about these dreams, I think, with the both of you and uh also some of the hibaksha and i think it was a uh, and mom you can correct me if i'm wrong but it may have been when i shared it with you and mr aihara um you both had suggested that i write letters uh maybe write a letter to president reagan because this was the 1980s and the cold war was really spiking at that time the uh, the nuclear arms race where we were trying to uh you know, break the USSR, USSR, uh, through the nuclear arms race, uh, right. got me motivated to write these letters. And so I wrote a letter to President Reagan. I think we have uh, a photograph up on the screen of you, of your letter there. <laughs> yeah, so I, I remember I wrote the letter and I had some allowance, about 10,000 yen, which was probably about $80 or 70 some dollars at the time. And I put it in the, the envelope and my request to the president was to, if he could fly himself to Tokyo, then he could take the bullet train with his 10,000 yen uh, down to Hiroshima so he could visit uh, Peace Park. And I think uh, there was a TV show that came out and interviewed us. I don't know whatever happened to that interview, but I, I know think it was that- the, It was the NBC Today Show, correct, Mother? Yeah. Yeah, yes. NBC Today Show flew over and they, they did a documentary. Um, and I don't know, Mother, if you can, talk well, about first I just want to say that uh, Gavin's story is a little bit uh, different uh, we woke up with the screams every night mm. and in the middle of the night your question was you know that God can uh, catch one bomb but what if everybody starts dropping the bombs and oh, yeah. you couldn't go back to sleep and you actually I, uh, I said well we have to do something and you actually decided you said what if I write a letter to President Reagan and well, that you wrote the letter. Well, and I do. I I do remember. It's funny because you talk about making people waymakers and listening to this and you know reading reading your first book. Uh, it makes me realize that the writing the letter is once I wrote the letter and once it was sent, the nightmares I think just stopped right then they and there. Stopped so cool. because you were able to do something. You took power. Yeah. 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 So I you know had, we're going to okay. see part of the the documentary. Uh, lost generation um, here in a in a little in a little bit, and I think um, everyone watching will get a better idea of, of what 
Gavin was was talking about. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so that was um, so. Mother, why don't you go back and kind of back to the beginning? How did how did we get on this journey, and how did you just decide to take the two of us and go to go to Japan? Well, again, uh, Gavin's talk is much more interesting. Uh, is, uh, and I hope we can get back to him. Uh, but very quickly, it was 1979, and we were in Altoona, Pennsylvania, which is right not too far down the road from Three Mile Island, when the Three Mile Island nuclear accident happened. And if people are freaked out about the coronavirus today, you can't imagine how freaked out I was with two children uh, and the man's cows next door all died, the government, but the government said it was just a, a coincidence. And I don't know if it happened or not, but I do know that my friend's parents both got sick within six months and they died. And again, nobody wanted to think it was anything to do with the uh, radiation. And uh, uh, then, uh, Suddenly, I found myself in the middle. Of, I was a single. Suddenly, became a single parent family. Uh, it was eleven percent unemployment. Nothing was working. Uh, carpenter ants infested the house, and Gavin thought they were toys. <laughs> I don't know if that wasn't all um, bad enough. Went to sleep one night. Woke up in the, about four o'clock in the morning with a big uh, sign: Hiroshima across the sky, as if it was written by a, a, one of those airplanes. You know. Uh, and it happened four times. So anyway, I talked to you kids and uh, you decided to go with me uh, after some bribery. And uh, we sold the house and we left for Hiroshima. Oh, because I thought I had a call. And your question is going to be, did I go to interview a bomb survivors? No, I had no idea there were survivors, I had no idea about it. I just went because nothing else was working and I went to Japan, Hiroshima, headed for Hiroshima. And so the first place that we went was not Hiroshima, um, and it was actually Shikoku in a city called Imabari, uh, which was right on the Inland Sea, which we, you know, looking back on it, didn't really have that much to do with Hiroshima. But um, for you, it, it ended up starting that next portion, that next part of your journey. Right. Well, we actually went to Tokyo where I ran out of money. I got us tickets as far as Tokyo. And then I was going to take the train down to Hiroshima. But nobody knew anybody in Hiroshima. And they were, I was told nobody's going to talk to me about Hiboksha because there weren't any anymore. That's what I was told. So I knew somebody in Shikoku and I wrote and I asked him to sponsor me as an English teacher. He did. That was Mr. Ito. Uh, and he was a bit of a control freak, which led to a lot of problems. But we went down and he got you into school. For international school and number two, there was no international school. And at that time, we were the only foreign family in the city. So uh, that's how we got there. And then what happened one day, we were all in the home door, the arcade, sipping green drinks when your teacher came up and sat down and Mrs. Yamamoto and asked if she could join us. And she's the one that said to me, I hear you've come over to interview A-bomb survivors. And she said, I have a secret, but you must promise to tell nobody, nobody, nobody. And I think that's your next question. Right. So, um, you know, I can remember coming home from school um, the the next day and with a note to give to you. I, I feel like there was a lot of secrecy. There was you know, notes being passed back and forth and uh, a lot of secrecy. And Gavin, I don't know if you want to jump in and speak to this as well, but we were never really allowed to talk about it. And we didn't understand why at the time, but um, can, you, can you speak to all the secrecy and we had to go through? Do you remember it? Do I remember? Yes. Yes, I remember people having, when they would come over to the house to to speak with you about being a Hibakusha, it was, you. they they usually whispered uh, 
even in a low voice, they would talk to us in a low voice. I also remember that, uh, and again, I'm, I was very young, so maybe my memory is a little off, but I remember that there were only so many people that were designated okay to speak to the press. And then you ended up finding more people by going to the World Friendship Association, the, the, the Quakers, who had connection, like almost like an underground connection to all the Hibaksha that were obviously living in Hiroshima uh, and would would connect you with the people who had hardly ever spoken or were uh, too quiet or too, too not afraid, but too shame, uh, shame. shame to, to speak. Well, I'm going to say, yes, but I'm going to go back to Shikoku right now. And this is Yamamoto, who is a lady. Her secret was that she was Hibaksha, but she made us promise that we would never, 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 never tell anybody. So then that next day, week when Deidre went back to school, she got another note from her and we were invited over to her house because she wanted to talk to us about something very secretly and we were not to tell anybody we were going to her house and she would send a taxi for us that night. So that night the taxi came and you looked out the window and said, who's in the back seat? <laughs> and anyway, we went down and here it was Mr. Ito in my sponsor, the one that I was supposed to be asking permission from. And he was very upset. And he said, why you go to Mrs. Yamamoto's house and you don't tell me? And I said, well, how did you know where we're going? And he said, the taxi driver called him. And he had it so lined up that no matter what we did, he knew every single thing we were doing. And he had the taxi com companies that if anybody came to my, our house, they were called. So then we went to Mrs. Yamamoto's and I said to him in the back seat, I said, does she know you're coming? He said, no. So we got out of the car and her face was horrible. And she looked at me like I had really betrayed her. And then later she said, why did you tell him? And I said, I didn't tell him. Uh, he, the taxi company called him. There's, there's Mrs. Yamamoto, her wonderful husband. And there's um, Deidre and Gavin and me over there. And that was the night that and Mr. Isaka was there too. And uh, she was very gracious and gave him dinner, but she never talked about anything. We just talked. Then it was when we got home that night, Deidre had another note for me. And the note told, said that I had to be downstairs at a certain day at four o'clock in the morning. She had found a young man from a nearby town, Saijo, to take me. She had lined up my first interview in Nagasaki at the Nagasaki A-bomb hospital. But again, I was to tell nobody. So you kids had to stay at home, pretend I was there, lock the door. I would be gone for two days. You had things like you could go outside, Gavin, and call up and say, mother, should I get some milk at the store? And then Deidre would pretend to be the mother. And it just was such a pl wonderful plan. I don't know what wrong with it. <laughs> but I went on to Nagasaki. You left you two kids, 11 and four or five, alone in a country where you didn't know the language, you didn't have any friends, no relatives, and a crazy person <laughs> who was uh, uh, controlling us. Anyway. So, yeah, so tell us about that whole Nagasaki, the whole trip to Nagasaki, because it's not like you could just jump on a train from Chikoku to Nagasaki. It was a like a half-day trip and... Tell so us half about day, that. Half day trip. I had no idea where I was going. I didn't have the money, I don't think, to go. Mrs. Yamamoto must have uh, paid my uh, ferry fare, plus Mr. Saijo. I'll call him Mr. Saijo. I've forgotten his name. And then when we got over to Hiroshima, we got a train down to Nagasaki, and we left at four o'clock in the morning. And so I get to the ferry, and he says to me, Where's breakfast? Being a woman, I guess I was supposed to make breakfast. That never dawned on me. Uh, I said, well, I thought we could buy something on the ferry. He said, well, they're not open until six. So he said, I'll go to the vending machine. And he came back from the vending machine with big, big, I mean, really big bottles of beer and uh, dried squid. And that was for breakfast. Well, I had no intentions of you know, Limburger cheese is one thing, but dried squid and beer or something else. So he was drinking and eating, and then we got to Hiroshima, and then we caught the train very quickly to go to Nagasaki, 
but we, and I thought, well, we can get something to eat there, maybe some hard boiled eggs or a Coke, something good. <laughs> and uh, we didn't have time, but he got me on the train and he said, okay, he'd go get something. So he went, came back on the train with more beer and more squid. So on the way on the train down, he started talking and he said, you must be really scared. I said, why? He said, well, you must be very brave to be willing to go in to the A-bomb hospital and interview people after what your country did <laughs> and drop the bomb. And now you're going to go and ask this lady to tell you about it. He said, that really takes something. And I started thinking about it and I started drinking the beer and eating the squid and drinking more beer and eating the squid. It was a long trip. We got there at noon. I thought, well, I can run in and get something to eat. But Mrs. Taida, who was Mrs. Yamamoto's friend and also an A-bomb survivor, and the head nurse of the hospital said, no, no, we don't have time. And we ran to the hospital to do my first interview in Nagasaki. And in the meantime, the boy who took me had me convinced that she was going to you know, really be upset with me. So I was ready. I was ready. I'm from, I'm from Appalachia Railroad Town. Go ahead, let her say anything she wanted to say. I could handle it. So we went in, and in the meantime, I was really feeling funny. I couldn't feel my nose. My lips felt funny, and uh, just everything was a little bit strange. And then I realized, I think I'm drunk, because it was 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, so I've been drinking beer up until 12 o'clock and eating squid. And, uh, but still, I got there, and I was really dizzy. But when I got into the bedroom and I saw this frail little woman in the middle of the bed, she was so small. And they said, before you talk to her, she has something to say to you. And I said, okay, what? And she said, I'm going to read it just a little bit. She said, and I was ready for it. She said, at least I thought I was. She said, I'm sorry. Very, very, very sorry. Please accept my apology. Please tell all Americans, I'm so sorry. Japan started this war. We are responsible. Anyway, I don't know what happened. I don't know if it was the divorce, the beer, the Ica, the Carpenterians, but I got a crying drag and I couldn't ask one question through the whole interview. So the fellow who brought me asked all the questions he wanted to ask. And uh, I got her story and I just sat there and cried for the whole time. Everybody was so impressed with my compassion mm. that I was able to line up many more interviews. Can, can you read a little bit of that interview? Okay, well, um, I can. She just said, basically, I heard the air raid when I was walking home to fix lunch. I quickly ran to the shelter. I was safe. I waited. And as I was waiting the shelter for the all clear sound, a very strange thing happened. I was sucked out of the shelter, blown and thrown clear across the road. It was especially strange because there was no sound. I was just picked up and sucked out and I was flying. Then everything became black. I wasn't knocked out or anything, but I couldn't see anything. I couldn't even see across the street. I don't remember anything, everything, but I remember my back was on fire. So she crawled back to the shelter and she stayed for five days before anybody found her. Uh, she said, uh, it must have been my husband who found me. I told him my back was on fire, and I tried to put the fire out, but I couldn't. He looked, but he told me there was nothing wrong with my back, not even one mark, but it burned so much. Anyway, it was the radiation, and she spent most of her life in the hospital, circulation, all kinds of things were wrong with her, from even though she was in the shelter. And I, I, I thought that was interesting. And uh, uh, go ahead, what, what's your next question? No, I, I think may, now might be a, um, a good time to show a portion of the documentary, 10 minutes of the documentary, Lost Generation. To get but, an idea of what To get an like, idea. Yes. So I'm going to uh, look for it on my computer here and I will let you and Gavin um, give a little background to, to, the, to the documentary. Okay, I forgot to tell something uh, also about uh, Mrs. Yamamoto, so I'll tell it when I come back, okay? But this film 
was taken and the people didn't even get it back until 1980s when the Sunshine Law, uh, they had to buy it back. The gov our government wouldn't give it back. People all over Japan sent money. They bought enough money to buy 80, 85, 90, I thought 100,000 feet of film. And it, they put it together and nobody saw this film until 1984, I think, maybe 1982. And it was gifted to me in 1982, 1983, and I've taken it around the world and shown it. Uh, but this okay. is why. Go ahead. Go ahead. We're just going to go. go um, can you hear it, though? Go ahead. Let's see. I can't hear it yet. It says digging no. air raid shoulder. All I remember is an incredible blast. No sound yet. I'm going to redo that. So keep talking a little bit about it. Okay, so it wasn't until 1984, um, 35, 36, 37 years later that anybody even saw this film. And we're not showing the whole film, but even the people who are in the film, they didn't see this until 35, see themselves until 35 years later. And uh, it's a very emotional film. We're just gonna show 10 minutes of it, okay. just to give you an idea. <laughs> そして、やっと。もう記述ですからね。ピカッとしたその光だけしか知りませんのでね。ものすごいその音がしたとか。風が吹いたとか、その意識を失って、しばらくしてから目が覚め、たらもう上半身は焼けただれだったと。私は40日間ぐらいは意識が朦朧としてましてね。それで、熱がだいたい40度前後のやつがずっと続いてたってわけです。だからあの、寝てまして
、手圧をしてもらって一緒に2回ですねそれでなんとか体が持てていっているんです。Sumiteru Taniguchi was delivering a telegram in Nagasaki when the blast threw him flat on his face. His shoulders, back, buttocks, and arms were deeply burned. He lay for a year and nine months on his stomach. Bed sores decayed his flesh, and the pain grew worse and worse. He remembers crying out again and again, please kill me. But Mr. Taniguchi survived. He became the father of two children and still works at the telegraph office. Despite the suffering at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the United States, the Soviet Union and other countries are producing more and more nuclear weapons. Weapons are equivalent to more than one million bombs of the size that fell on Hiroshima. Enough to destroy all life on Earth many times over. We live under this threat. それは今幸せに暮らしていますよそれだが戦争いうものはまあ二度とやるもんじゃないし子供たちがかわいそうなんやねほんま街を歩いておりましてもねもう今は本当綺麗になっておりますそして皆さんたちもですね楽しくあの過ごしていらっしゃいますけど、ね、今の時私が受けたようなね恐ろしいことが起きたらねどうなるかないうことをね常にあの思いますもう初めて鏡を見た時にはですね私鏡をパーンとしてたんですよびっくりして。絶望しましまたその時はですね,ねえ傷者にね自分の精神も捨ててしまって結婚もまあ結婚もできなかったしですねこの辺ちょっと待ってここがかいいのこれ結構ケロイドのところがですねかわいいんですのさあどうぞ私のはい元気であったらはいお前てよ車椅子に乗ってでもはい国連に行って国連に行ってはい訴えたい,訴えたいで私が14歳の時にやられましたけれども当時の大人の人たちがねもう少し戦争について厳しく反対をしねあの平和のために頑張ってくれてたら。戦争もなかっただろうにそうなればね私どももこんなにしてやけなくても済んだですからそんな思いをさせたくないと思ってね、まあ、今本当に侮辱ですけれども天、まあ、観天堂をね、まあ、やらせていただいてるわけです。Today, there are still more than 370,000 people in Japan, known as Hibakusha, who suffer from the effects of the atomic bomb. Their lifespan is unknown, and they bear terrible scars. They have suffered physical pain and also mental pain. For some, seeing themselves as they were on that day has been almost unbearable.
The suffering has gone on and on. Out of respect for these people, we must ensure that it never happens again. Never again, Hiroshima. Never again, Nagasaki. Never again, the atomic bomb. This is the appeal of those who know the horror of nuclear war. Nuclear weapons are a product of humankind. And as humankind, we should have the power to abolish them. Indeed, a, a very emotional and uh, impactful piece. So, can I say something? So, that's why I'm saying that maybe this presentation is a little different from others. It's not just about the bombing and buildings falling down and cities disappearing. Uh, and if we can raise the level from victim to waymakers and actually listen as though they're telling us a story that, you know, war just doesn't work. And uh, whether we realize it or not, I think all of us want to build a better world. I think we're, that's one of our purposes here to make things better. So, so go ahead. So getting back to when you, um, came back from Nagasaki, back to Shikoku, you know, oh. I, I, I know you wanted to talk about that, the, yeah, yeah, talk so about I, a little bit about that. Yeah, Does I that do, because it was a very you? important part. Uh, it, when I came back from Nagasaki, after being away from two days for you, from you and Gavin, and walked up and you opened the door, you both looked at me and said, he knows, he knows, he knows, he knows. And apparently it was Mr. Ito, and he actually turned me in and he turned uh, Mrs. Uh, Yamamoto in. And about 10 o'clock, uh, maybe the next night, we had a very loud bang at the door. And it was Mr. T from uh, Mombusho. Now Mombusho was so strong. It's a Department of Education in Japan, but they were so strong. It's almost like our CIA or the IRS getting, in, getting a knock and at night, and he came in and he was pleasant enough, uh, but he uh, asked, he said, I hear you went to Nagasaki. And I had forgotten that I promised Mrs. Yamamoto not to tell anybody anything. I had forgotten all the secret letters. And he said, I hear uh, you went to Nagasaki. Mrs. Yamamoto set up an uh, interview for you. And I said, yes, yes, it was wonderful. And she did that. And he said, I hear that you're talking to Mrs. N uh, Yamamoto and she's telling you her story. Yes, yes, a terrible story. Yes, I'm so grateful. And the more he asked about uh, Mrs. Yamamoto, the more I admitted to everything she was doing. And I had a little ding ding in the back of my head about secrecy and about the way he was acting. But it still didn't dawn on me because I didn't understand the shame and so finally, after about 45 minutes, he said, I see I have to talk directly to you. In other words, I think the uh, translator was, you're not very smart. <laughs> you're not getting the point. And I said, okay. And he said, Mrs. Yamamoto is not allowed to talk to you. It's a disgrace for the school. It will get her in trouble. She is not allowed as a teacher to be saying these things. And I was shocked and I said, well, why? Because after all, it was like over 35, 37 years ago. He said, because the emperor is still living. And the emperor didn't die until 1988. And I'd like to take that over to Gavin to see if he remembers what happened. We were in Hiroshima by now, but does he remember what happened when the emperor died? How all of a sudden, do you remember? How all of a sudden for two weeks, people were saying, 
everything that they wanted to say for 50, 75, 80 years about the emperor. Do you remember? I do remember, and I think, but I do also remember at, at his passing, they could no longer refer to him by name, and it was the emperor of such and such era, or Showa no Tenno, or the yes. emperor of the Showa era. So I remember how everyone was speaking more freely for a brief period, but also uh, they were not mentioning anyone's name. And it was chalked up more to the era than to an individual, which, you know, in hindsight and looking at history books and everything, that makes sense that it was the chalked up to the era, not an individual. Yes. And, um, oh, go ahead, because I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, oh, but the people, when they were talking to me, like classes, adults were saying how disappointed they were that he never took responsibility that he didn't retake responsibility, that he didn't say he was sorry. And that went on and on and on. And people who lost their you know, Hadaki, or, uh, the uh, kamikaze and all these people that put their lives up for the government because they thought he was God and they wanted him to say something. He didn't. He died. And they let whoever they is, let people talk for about two weeks. And then that was the last time you heard anybody say anything against the emperor. It's an amazing, amazing country. <laughs> so yeah. um, do you want to read another excerpt from another one of the interviews? We have about uh, 10 minutes left. And I do. I, I want to say, I want to say the reason the film is called Lost Generation of the 9,600 seventh and eighth grade students at Hiroshima at that time, 8,050 were killed instantly. Only 550 students survived. For me, that is the most unforgettable event of that day. It's from a teacher that was the guy with the white hair that had the uh, glass in his eye. Gavin, you were in that interview with me. Uh, they called him Sensei Moritaki. Anyway, and then I'll read Matsubata. We all knew Matsubata. And she said, I was just a young girl that day. I was so burned. I lived, but I knew I could never have a normal life. There was a big stigma against Hibaksha. No one wanted to marry me. And if a Hibaksha did get married, they were afraid to have children. I remember that day I was on fire, not fire from flames, but fire from the radiation. My face melted, my skin on my arms and hands melted right before my eyes. I ran to the river to jump in, but the river was lined from bank to bank with bodies floating. Most of them were dead. It was horrible, but I felt on fire, so I jumped in anyway. It didn't take the brain away. Anyway, she w goes on to say about how she got home and she was so thirsty, but she was afraid to drink because she saw many people sitting on the ground and moaning in pain and calling for water. But when anyone gave them a drink, they died immediately. More, many, many people told me that. Uh, they didn't you... know why they died, but they died. Okay, we had uh, someone just wrote in a question asking um, if it, why, why the water would kill people. I don't know. Uh, and, and the nurses told me, she told me, and she went home, suffered in pain. I could hear the calls for water all through the day. But radiation has to do with it, the radiation, radiation and drinking. And I don't know. I have no Was idea. Deidre, is the question about uh, on the day of what happened, why people were passing from the, wa from the water? Yes. Because I remember it being explained to me, it, maybe it was in school, the Japanese schools, uh, the, the severe heat and dehydration, and people were jumping into the water because they were, they were uh, suffering to, to, so they jumped into the water and uh, basically their stomachs expanded and exploded. Uh, when they would do that. Uh, that's what it was explained to me. I don't know if that's, that's not scientific, but that's what happened. Right. Um, so, you know, we, we saw the, we saw the documentary and we, we hear these stories and, you know, you, we um, want to raise up the way makers and make sure that they're that they are our way makers for peace. But really when you see all these bombs and you see the, the devastation is, 
can we can we really do this? Can we really stop war? Uh, I'm going to answer that. Two questions. The one question is, no, absolutely, we cannot stop. Do you see some of these things that we have that we're putting into the air and the big planes? And you see that celebration, July 4th celebration, and how people, and I guess here in Maui, too, they have these things. Somebody at work had gone out to see all these wonderful things that we spend our money on. You can go up straight up in the air and drop the bombs. So I want to say, no, we can't stop that. It's too far ahead of us. But you know what we can do? We can build peace. We cannot stop war, but we can build peace. And uh, an example, I'll give you an example. Gavin sent me this book by Thomas Graham called The Al Alternate Route. And Thomas Graham is an ambassador. He served as senior U.S. diplomat in every major international arms control pro, uh, non-proliferation negotiation from 1970 to 1997 and saw that the nuclear arms race came down, saw that the nuclear arms race went up, depending on the president. And so what did he do? He started something entirely different. He went to the other side of the arms race and he started making nuclear free zones. So instead of trying to get rid of the bomb, or the, uh, you know, spending his time there, you know, it's biblical. In the Bible, it says, uh, resist not evil, because if you resist it and fight it, you become part of it. So you have to step aside, Aikido, whatever. You have to step aside and find the other side of it. And you don't fight against something. You build what you want. And that's what we can do. We can build what we want. And I'm going to read a question that somebody sent to me. And it was about the coronavirus and they said, do you think that as a society, we are overreacting? Are we reacting in fear of public shaming? Are we reacting to prove we are compassionate? What if we as humanity reacted this way to violence and our com in our communities? For example, what about anyone who hit a spouse was to remain in isolation until they were cured? I mean, that's a really good question. Another point we could do. We could make aloha zones. You know, you have nuclear free zones. We could start building aloha zones where we don't allow certain activity. And so what we have to do, I think one reason that war became so successful is because we don't know what to do. War has been successful, but it isn't successful. The way makers have shown it doesn't go away. It, it just gets worse and worse and worse, more and more buildup. The Nisei veterans went and fought a war to end all wars. And that was supposed to bring peace. But we have to get smarter. And we've had people show us different ways. But we need to come up with some more ideas. And I think Japan has done a marvelous job with that. I mean, you can go to Japan. It's one of the safest countries. You can drop your wallet. You can... and. and Gavin lost money one day. By the time he got back from the store, panicked because he didn't have the money. The police had brought it to me. They have a very good system. What I didn't know at the time is when they gave me my money back, I was supposed to give 10% of that to the person who found it. Of course, I just said, thank you. <laughs> Put it in my pocket and it sent Gavin back to the store again. But yes, we can build peace. And this is a century I believe that it's going to come because suddenly we have all these peace groups. How many, how many different people have the Hiroshima and Nagasaki story telling today or this, this year? I will you say know. it's the most I've ever, it's yeah. really the most I've ever seen. Um, yes. It's everywhere on Facebook and, and yeah. on TV and um, HPR did a, yes. uh, and, NPR and, uh, did a, a big thing. Yeah, that's so right. It's nice. Yeah. It's really nice so to, to see it. So now we're allowed to tell it. But see, the powers to be had this great idea that, you know, longer we keep it quiet, then people get bored. And you say, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And quite frankly, everybody does, oh, yeah, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Day. Okay, so what are you doing next week? You know, right. so it has it. So that's why we have to humanize it, humanize these people, and make a commitment to them that they won't be forgotten. Wow. They are our waymakers. Thank you. Um, but Gavin, sum up a little bit. 
Yeah, Gavin, you want to give some, we, we have a few minutes left. Do you want to just give some, some parting words? Well, I think uh, she's, she, uh, our mother is basically made a great case for peace and it's not by fighting war it's by building the society we want so if we want peace we have to build a peaceful society and you know i know um, the quaker lobby the friends committee on national legislation their their slogan is love thy neighbor so if we if we start in our homes and our neighborhoods and we just build uh we build we build what we want and by that that will grow and the 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 idea of peace will grow past the boundaries of of war i don't know yeah well yeah, you know thank there's you. about it yes thank you thank you both kids well yes okay um we want to thank you for for coming on today and for all of these years of advocacy and to thank all the people who spoke to you too and who were such a big part of our lives. Let's go back and see if Gavin's crying. <laughs> anyway. I'm smiling happiness for the both of you. Oh yeah, right. So, uh, you know, we wanna thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. This was um, a little bit different than our, our average normal um, afternoon with the author. But again, it, this was in memory of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We know that we do have a couple other talks coming up on August 25th. We will be speaking with Micah Kane. He is the CEO and president of uh, Hawaii Community Foundation. And he's going to be speaking about uh, philanthropy in this time of COVID-19 and specifically Hawaii's response to it. And then our next afternoon with the author is going to be September 19th at 1.30 in the afternoon. And that's going to be with Lee Cataluna and her book, The Folks You Meet in Longs. Um, some delightful stories. We will also have her book here at the center available for a $20 donation. It is signed. And we do still have uh, some of Melinda's books here at the center as well, Waymakers for Peace for a $10 donation. May I say that the donation goes back to the uh, uh, MEO, or no, I'm sorry, to uh, Nisei Veterans? They're a very good organization too. Yes. <laughs> we, we thank you. We thank her for that. And we thank all of you for tuning in. And uh, until next time, we wish you all a very happy, um, a very good week. Take care. Be well. And thank you, Mother, on behalf of... Um, Gavin and I. Thank you for being our mother. And uh, aloha all. Have a lovely weekend. Go home and hug your loved ones. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. We'll see you next time. Aloha. Okay. <laughs>